Fabulous with Vibs and Vicky, the Think Shift podcast for professionals who aspire to be fabulous leaders, those who not only succeed, but also purposefully seek to reinvent the world. Welcome to the Be Fabulous podcast. This is the beginning of a brand new series we're going to be doing, which is Imagine a Reinvented World. And uh, I have one of my friends and a really, really big thinker joining me for this series. His name's Sean Beard. You're going to learn about more about, learn more about him as he introduces himself shortly. And uh, in this series, the idea is we're going to take an idea, a crazy idea, and just say, just imagine if, imagine if. And so today's topic, before I let uh, Sean introduce himself, is imagine a world without garbage. Is that possible? Over to you, Sean. How are you doing? Uh, doing well. Thanks, Vips. Um, so my name is Sean Beard. I am a vice president. as a day job, I guess. I'm a vice president with Pariveda Solutions, and I help run or lead a group called Emerging Technology. And so part of uh, a little part of my day job is to try to look into the future, determine where technology is going and how we can guide our clients into that future. Um, and have them really be able to leverage and take advantage of what's coming. And so what about the what about the real job after that then? The one we're here to the talk re- about. After, oh, well, we're, yeah. So uh, one, one of the things that I love is um, trying to think about, you know, like, like Vip said, trying to make the world a better place. And <clears throat> the idea I had about a world without garbage actually initially came to me when I was with my uh, daughter at the dollar store. This was pre-COVID lockdown, and this was actually around Halloween last year, where I went to the dollar store and realized that what was once kind of an overflow for extra stock that stores wanted to get rid of, that there's now specific dollar store packaging and specific things that that is being done to market directly towards the dollar store. And, And admittedly, all that I could go, all that went through my head was, seems like that's a lot of waste. So you mean uh, like the packaging and the, the, the right. around the products that are in dollar stores? Is that basically what you mean? Correct. Okay. Right. It, yeah. It's not just an overflow of what, what, what was in the other stores that they want to get rid of. Now it's a specific market segment that's being manufactured for, which is wow. that dollar store market. So, and, and, those, and, it, and I just started thinking, okay, so now we've got all the extra that was there before because that's just gotten worse as, as population goes up. Um, then we've got this other waste that's coming in from all of the things directly for the dollar store. And, and so I started thinking about, okay, where does all that waste really go? And I know that we have recycling and I know that we have all of these things, these mechanisms that are in place that have been in place since I was in school, you know, they really came into seventies and eighties when recycling started becoming a little bit more popular. And, and I live in Seattle so I know that there's a whole lot of rules I have to follow on how I deal with my waste even today. Um, but I started thinking about how practical is all of that? And, and is it really something? I mean, the rules that we have for what's recycling versus compost, they change every year. And there's a lot of them. And I guarantee you, we don't get them all right. So it's uh, so I started thinking about, started rethinking garbage in general and, and how we think about it. And that's kind of where the idea, that's kind of where this idea came from. So what is the idea in a nutshell? Give us some stats. So give us some statistics around why, I mean, I, I got no idea. How, how, much, how much garbage are we producing? Um, I don't have an exact number, but, but, but one of the things that, that I love to talk about is razor blades. I think about razor blades and just thinking about something, you know, because again, you I'm You mean like part razor of, blades that you shave with? That you shave with. Okay, all right. right. As opposed to utility box cutters and things like that, right? Yeah, if we just think about the, the, the razor blades that we shave with. And, and I thought about this again because I'm a, I'm a member of the Gillette Shave Club. And so every quarter, they'll send me some new razor blades. And I looked at the razor blades and I thought, 
Hmm. There's no real recycling program for razor blades. Um, so what, what, and so I looked up those numbers and, and a, basically we throw in the United States, we throw about 2 billion razor blades into landfills every year. 2 billion. 2 billion. And that wow. translates into about 1 million pounds of steel. And that's U.S. alone. That's U.S. alone. Every year. So thinking about, so <laughs> what things like that does is it starts making me think, what all is in landfill? How much, if we can throw a million, <laughs> million pounds, pounds of, of steel. steel a year into the landfills just in the United States, what else? You know, and you start thinking about how much electronics have gone into landfills, how yeah. much copper, how much of these precious metals that, that are popped, that are, have to be put into all of our cell phones that we upgrade every year or every other year. How much of those precious metals actually are living in the landfills? How much of all of these materials that we use regularly are winding up in the landfill. And, and so that, that just kind of like, and Vips, you know me, it's like that just sends my, I'm, I sends my brain on a journey, on a path, because I still keep trying to pull that thread and figuring out, okay, so if we're, if we're throwing all that stuff into the landfills, then let's, where, where does all the materials start, they come from? So if I think about metals, well, metals are, are typically mined. It's as horrible as it is. They're strip mined. And then you think about just the environmental impacts of a mining operation to, like, just talk about the razor blades, to generate or to get the iron ore out of the ground and then go through the, the, the heating process to melt that ore down to get rid of the impurities, to add the carbon, to harden it as steel, what is the overall environmental impact in terms of energy and pollution and destruction of the green space? And, you know, and there's an and that you can keep doing when you think about these things and starting to think about it. Is there, is, is there a better way? Is there a different way? Is there something we're missing? And, and a realization I had not too long ago was if I think about waste management, our, our process hasn't really changed in 10,000 years. It's, we so say more, say more. So, so whenever we want something, whenever we want something and we want stuff and I can, I, and, and there's this thing that I, I, I thought about a while back and I call it the stuff cycle where it's, it's this interesting irony where whenever we want something, we need to manufacture something. We need to go dig a hole in the earth and get the things out of it that we need. And a lot of cases, these are our metals and things like that, where we'll get all the stuff that we need. And then, um, and then whenever we're done with it, we're ready to throw it away, we dig another hole and we throw it into the earth. And so that they become our landfills. And even if you look at things that are 5,000 years old, today we call them archaeological digs. But at the end of the day, <laughs> you can go find all the broken pottery and all the things that were just a trash dump that we're now digging through to understand how people in that city lived. But at the end of the day, it's the same process. We... We get the clay, we, we mold it, we make the ceramics, and then when we're done with it or if it gets broken, then we just throw it into the landfill and we throw it back into a hole in the earth. Mm. That, that was kind of that stuff cycle yeah. where yeah. it's constant. And then I started thinking about, okay, so if we have all these things over, you know, if I just think about in the industrial era, so we're talking maybe since the late 1800s in the United States, of all the things that we have manufactured and thrown into landfills, is it possible, and this is the question, is it possible that we have enough sitting in those landfills that we don't need to go back into the earth to get any more? We just need to start thinking about a better management of what we already have. And that's where I start thinking about that world with, with no garbage, of how can we actually do that? And it becomes a management of what of our how we manage our waste and actually disrupting that process and changing waste management to actually make better use of the materials that we've already retrieved from the earth and just truly recycling them into something that's usable. So we're going to get into a couple of you know what I describe as some of the Sean's wonderful ideas around what we can do with that. But I just thought you know I wanted to just bring this home with a few. Like, uh, you know, just, just a little bit of Googling around. You know, the average American tosses 4.4 pounds of trash every single day. 4.4 pounds every day. Um, 
With about 323.7 million people living in the US, that's roughly 728 tons, sorry, 728,000 tons of daily garbage, which is enough to fill 63,000 garbage trucks that are ultimately going into landfill. That's 22 billion plastic bottles every year. I'm laughing because the numbers are so massive and it's, it's actually giving me heart palpitations thinking about it. Um, you know, that's, you know we, 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 we throw away enough office paper to construct a 12-foot high wall from Los Angeles to Manhattan. Um, and it's, th you know, 300 laps around the equator in paper and plastic cups, forks and spoons. Um, so, you know, it is a lot. Appro approximately half of the 254 million tons of yearly waste will meet its fate in one of, say, one of the 2,000 active landfills across the country. And that's the US alone. And that, uh, thank you for the uh, uh, American landfills and waste production stats on saveonenergy.com for, uh, for those stats. Um, but it is quite extraordinary when you think about those numbers. And I guess 4.4 pounds, I mean, we're all contributing to it all the time, every day. Sobering. It, it, it really is. And, and again, that's where I think back to our waste management processes, again, haven't changed ever. I mean, I, I think 10,000 years is long enough to say ever. Um, and so I think, and so it's time to start thinking about it differently. Even, even the way we treat things or we, we have our mental models of what, these, what they are, how we deal with trash is very different than how we think about recycling or composting or things like that. And, and I think part of the thing is because we've separated them, we've, we've made it harder on ourselves because of all the rules. So, so one of the things that was really disheartening, and I believe this happened last year, was countries in Asia used to buy our plastic waste and our recycling, our plastic recycling. And they have since stopped doing that because of contamination. Um, part of the problem with recycling and, and, you know, we could probably a whole other topic is why altruism, um, why it has to make money in order to be viable. But um, you know, there's not a lot of money in recycling and the margins are really thin. So whenever we're sending them plastics that are contaminated, the actual human labor costs start exceeding what they can actually get out of recycling it. So they're like, well, we're not going to do it anymore because it's not cost effective for us to buy U.S. Uh, plastics. So today, whenever you're even throwing your plastics into the recycle bin, they're landing in, a, they're going to a landfill right now because there's nobody there to buy them. Well, that's Nobody's pretty actually, sorry sean that's pretty can you say that again um is that is that there must be some proportion that's ended up being recycled though or are you saying all the plastic that's been contaminated not not all but like if you think about things like your plastic like the example I've, I've given to people is if you think about you know again you know you're sitting at a conference or a meeting or you're at a meeting in a hotel um you get those really thin single-use plastic water bottles that are there and throughout the course of the meeting you know you drink the water and that's fine. But then, you know, as a fidget, you kind of peel the label off and you tie it really tight so it looks like a straw and then you drop it right into the bottle, right? That bottle's now contaminated and requires a person to go pull that paper out in order to make it a recyclable again, right? So, and that, that, that's an extreme example, but it's not all plastics are going to make it there because some can definitely be recycled and and when we start talking about things like energy companies have very large recycling programs that actually will bring plastics back in and take them in and give them more industrial, um, giving them industrial uses and things like that. But a lot of what consumer waste that we throw into our recycling is going to wind up in a landfill because nobody's a, nobody is buying that plastic from us or nobody's buying those that garbage from us. That's pretty damning, right, of all of our recycling programs. Mm -hmm. And and part of it, I think, is is again, like I said, it's not profitable to to and these are private businesses, and a lot of these businesses do rely on um, government subsidies to stay afloat and things like that. Um, you know, which again, the irony that goes through this whole space is just there. It's something that we and there's a large group of us that feel is so important, but yet, in order to stay afloat, the government has to pay them. To, mm. to stay in business and so um it also you know there's a lot of there's a lot of damning of things that we could look into when we really think of when we get down to it but 
it's but and, and then we look at the technology the technology isn't as advanced as it could be um I, i've gone on a tour of a recycling facility here in seattle and they're doing you know i mean the machines are doing what they can but i i wouldn't call it a place where machine learning is going to have a place anytime in the near future right where you could actually start doing a lot of a lot of lot better sorting and things like that um so, with, so with those plastics. So, okay, so you know, I, I know you're a big ideas guy. So, what do we do with this? Like, so I mean, we've I think we've framed the scale of the challenge, and um, I mean, we got all sorts of dynamics here. We got government, you got government regulations, you've got uh, policies, you've got the, um, uh, the 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 challenges of deploying technology where it should be maybe mm -hmm. but ultimately against the backdrop of it's it, i guess it seems like it's quite hard to make money from dealing with trash so we just create more of it yes and and we run into a big and we run into a big problem um and it's you know it, it really starts to be this problem of energy so if i think about if I think about, you know, like the, there was, I was in, I was in Alaska. I, I was fortunate enough to take a trip to Fairbanks, Alaska, and they have a hot springs uh, thermal area right outside of Fairbanks mm -hmm. that my wife and I went to. And what we, what they had there is this, it's really this interesting place where they're using the thermal hot springs for all of their energy. And they also designed a machine that could sit on a desktop, which could take those single use plastic bottles and turn them back into petroleum. Seriously, which was really fascinating. Yes, that, that's and like you that could thing give it a plastic from, uh, bottle. Back to the future, right? Almost, it's getting <laughs> Mr. It's Fusion. Getting I think on the back of the DeLorean. <laughs> right. And 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 that's really important because a lot of plastic is is all petroleum based. Because when I look at plastics, I see a lot. I see a a vault, if you will, for 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 oil and things that. And if we can get that back. If we can get that oil back, it can then be reused for any number of things, including going back into more plastics if you wanted to. But the problem we run into is that whenever we created these materials, it's what, I, what, what I've called the negative energy problem. Is that, And this is why it becomes hard to make a profit off of recycling. It's because in a lot of ways, recycling requires that you put more energy into it than what you're going to get back out of it. Right. So that's definitely the case with plastics. That's why... Most recycling facilities focus on paper and aluminum because that's a profitable sector because the amount of energy you put in is less than what you'll get out of it. But we have to, and that's where we start running into these um, problems with how do we solve the negative energy problem. And, and that's where we get into like this concept where you have systems of systems at play, right? Where green tech is a big space. And so, you know, we could start looking at we're okay, where are we going to get this energy from? And so we can start looking at, well, we've got a lot of wind and solar. And and I somebody would have to fact check uh, Elon Musk on this one, but he was claiming that by the end of 20, I believe it was by the end of 2020, that more than 50% of energy generation in the United States will be from non petrochemical sources, meaning it's all going to be solar or wind or hydro. Like Is that I'm all renewable, Washington. basically? Correct. Yeah. Correct. And so, but what we're also running into that Tesla's trying to solve is the is the battery density problem of how do we store all that energy? And you could look at Australia and they're trying to do a lot and they've got these massive battery complexes in Australia trying to store all the energy that they're, that they're able to generate. And so... Because a lot of what happens with these solar farms or um, or wind farms, they either they have to keep like the windmills. They only can run a few of them because they need to. They don't have any way to actually store the energy. Yeah. So if they generate a lot, then it just dissipates, and we lose it. Um, or if they are like in solar, there's no way to turn it on, turn it off per se. Um, a lot of it will just get dissipated into the atmosphere. So we'll lose that energy that we were able to capture. And so one of the things I think is starting to think about how do we, how do we actually have a much more efficient electric grid that we'd be able to have better storage of these things. And I've even said, we need to put our recycling centers right next to these uh, green, like solar farms or wind farms, 
because that's a place that could take advantage of the energy, as much energy as they can produce, simply because, like you said, we, we do four pounds of garbage a day. So there's, there's lots of things that we could do to generate that. And we're not contributing negatively back, meaning we have a lot of, we have a lot of polluting or carbon or anything like that going into the atmosphere. We are just using what we naturally created to actually power this process. So we're actually able to shrink the overall energy footprint, even if it's not as efficient on doing some of these plastics and things like that. Mm. So, and, and so it's stop. I mean, one of the things that I know that people do, and this is, this is again, part of, part of how business is business, but it really needs to be connecting these pieces together, like connecting the power generation with the recycling, because those things can then work together to, to have less of an impact. And then we're able to get a lot more good out of it. Um, but again, like our, these solar farms and everything are typically pretty far away from cities. I know that the closest wind farm to Seattle is uh, on the other side of the Cascade Mountains. So it takes about an hour and a half two hours to drive there by car if you wanted to. So transporting waste all the way to the other side of the mountains. You'd like have metro, to... metro renewables. Right, right. You know, I, you know, hearing, I mean, clearly you've given us so much thought, Sean. So you know when you, when you think about, about this challenge, and to me, you know, the sustainability challenge is probably, you know, the biggest challenge we face as a planet for the next 100 years, 200 years. Mm. Um, it's existential, ultimately, and I know we're just we're using you know, garbage as a microcosm of that challenge. When when you think about it, you know, you know, imagine if you could do anything. How, how would you go about trying to, or what have you seen out there that people are working on, or have built, or technology that's available out there, or strategies you've you've seen out there? How, how would you how would you look at how you how how should you structure a program? to create a world without garbage. Yeah, I, I, I have thought about that. And I've also thought about, you know, trying to solve the other problem where I believe that that kind of initiative is also something that could be incredibly profitable, okay. which is, I think, an important aspect to this. So hold on, hold on, hold on. So, you're, so the reason why you, I just want to clarify, so the reason why you think it's so important for that to be profitable is because it's only if it's profitable we end up doing more of it and we need that, we need that momentum effect to, Correct. for it to be profit, profitable so, it's, so that we do more of it and by doing more of it we heal the planet. Right. And, and you know, in my jokes I'll say we heal the planet in spite of ourselves. In spite, yeah, that's right. <laughs> well, it sure like, we're sure as they're struggling to do it. <laughs> um, yeah, without, without thinking of it that way. So what would you do? How would you look at the program then? How do you look at that? So, so I, I would start, um, like I mentioned earlier, um, you know, it's kind of, I view it in three phases. Um, and, and I'll get to, when I get to the second phase, this was actually one of the big things that, that, that sent me off on this, uh, on this thought process. But uh, the first phase would really, like I said, get updating the recycling technology. We have a lot more that we can do mechanically and with computers than we could when a lot of these technologies were put, first put into place. I, I equate it to, you know, when I went to college, I had an HP calculator. And it was interesting because I had more computing power in my hand then. And it's a, or even if you think about your phones today, you have infinitely more computing power in your hands than what we sent to the moon. Yeah. And so the, the, it's, a, it's an opportunity to really take advantage of the technological advances or the additional capabilities technology has given us. And it gives us this thing where we can do better analysis. We can do better real-time thinking about, okay, I'm looking at something, having a machine being able to determine what it is I'm looking at. And then, and then having a decision tree that says, okay, well, this is, a, this is a metal of some sort. Let me just route it over to metals and then we can further refine it or this is a plastic, let's go here, let's do uh, you know, some sort of spectrography on it and say, hey, this is a number seven plastic, or sure. this is a number two plastic. So this is like, the, like, this is like the predecessor for Wally. -E. Kind of, yeah. I think Wally, -E, Wally's -E's an interesting movie that I've used a couple of times in a lot of, because it's a, it is an absolutely fascinating movie in so many different dimensions. <laughs> but, um, but yes, it, it is. It, it's, it's, a pre, it's a predecessor to it. Because again, the funny part is, is my, my daughter, 
when she was helping me uh, design robots that could help out with this process, she called it Wally because it's essentially something that sifts the garbage. So it would be uh, so. But so my daughter will have a hand if I ever build the machine. So when you say upgrading this, I, I you know, I, I want to ask you when you think about this phase, phase one, upgrading mm -hmm. recycling technology, you know, and 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 get better at identifying, sorting, sifting various types of plastic, metal, precious materials, whatever it may be. Um, in your mind, because uh, you're closer to it than I am, I mean, is the technology out there? We're just not deploying it that way because the economic case hasn't, hasn't, doesn't stack up yet? Or is it we have to invent a whole bunch of new stuff that just doesn't exist right now? Or some version of both? The technology is out there. There's okay. definitely a, a level of invention that would be there. Um, and then ultimately, the, the money is not necessarily there to do it. And, and it's not there to do it at scale, um, where it can, be, it can be somewhat profitable, or it can be viable for a, a business to put into place and be able to pay for it. Um, you know, there's, there's things that, and there's examples like that you can see all through waste management and things. Um, in landfills, dealing with the methane that comes off of landfills, there's one there's one company in the United States that makes the cleaning agent, and they are heavily subsidized by the government, um, and their agent is incredibly expensive because they can't scale it. They don't have the well, money. They can't scale the production to scale it. They can't scale the production. And what does it do to that chemical? Uh, what it does is a lot of the methane from the rotting, the organic material coming out of landfills is very, very dirty. And what it is, is it's a cleaning agent. So when it comes out, it becomes usable for fuel so oh. that you could use um, as a fuel and things like that. And it starts by just driving big old PVC pipes right down into a landfill, and those become your wellheads, and then they clean it and then uh, resell the fuel on the open market. So that's upgrading recycling tech. But I'm guessing that all the, all the um, sort of visual recognition, the ability to detect different types of metals and plastics, that must be all there right i mean like invented yeah it's all there the ability to do it is all there we just have to tell the machines what to do and okay. how to detect right there's just markers that we'll see um that can do it but yeah all that technology is there okay it's absolutely there all right phase two and then we roll into phase two and what phase two is 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 building the, what you know what's what we've called the recycling center of the future it's taking that tech and deploying it and start really starting to leverage it to, to have more efficient recycling. And this also, I mean, let me say, as we put that in, a big problem that needs to be solved is contamination. And so that's where we would be inventing things. That's where we, and this, this would be probably much more of a mechanical process than anything else on how we actually start inventing ways of solving the contamination problem. Because ultimately, just afford me one little tangent, this whole process starts with us and we're the ones generating the, the garbage or the waste or the recycling. And it all depends on our, on how much work we need to do. And, you know, people are busy and I don't, I don't hold any judgment or anything. Like I said, the rules in Seattle change every year. And like this year we can put the caps on the milk and put it in recycling. Whereas last year we couldn't or, you know, those types of things. Yeah, they're quite so, small and they're easy to forget. And... Exactly. And in a pinch, everybody knows that you can just throw it in the garbage, in the landfill. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And so it, much lower and if friction. we make the rules too cumbersome, and or yeah, that's perfect, perfect word. If there's too much friction in the process, then people aren't going to want to solve it. I mean, I've seen lots of people try to solve it many different ways, even like putting cameras on top of the cans. And then the one, like it, it'll detect that you have a napkin so it'll light up compost or it sees a can and it'll light up recycling, trying to tell you which can to put it in to just help out. But um, ultimately, I think we need to figure out ways of, of that not even being a thing where I can just take a garbage can, dump it on a conveyor belt and the machine sort it out and we're able to figure it out. Um, but in phase two, it's, it's more about recycling, upgrading the recycling technology to a point to where we're deploying all of this tech we did in phase one, having a much more efficient process and able to really kind of, and with that efficiency, we're able to, to have a much better outcome on top of um, what's getting recycled versus what needs to go to a landfill. 
Uh, rough numbers I saw last year was 20% of all recyclables actually get recycled. And then is that, um, is that all? You know, trying to push that number up. Gosh. Question Somewhere for, between 20 and 22%. Who, who are the big players in this space? Like, who's working this? Like the recycling center of the future. I mean, are they, are they, are they you know, significant companies or, 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 or um, no, agencies working? No, no there isn't. I, I wouldn't say there's significant companies. Um, you know, and I feel horrible because I cannot remember their name. Um, I was talking to them last year, but there is there is a place here in Seattle that I've been talking to that actually do manufacturing of recycling equipment. And so I had talked to them about, hey, if I were to come up with a new algorithm or we were to come up with something new, trying to just understand cost on what it would cost to get like just a prototype of a machine put together using some of the processes they have, but they're a very small outfit. They're, there's and they're the only ones, at least in the Seattle area, in the Seattle-Tacoma area, I've been able to really find that do this type of thing. So, Otherwise, it would just be a, a what I call a file new, where we just have to start from scratch and yeah. get the arc welders out. I think it says something about it says something about the world we're living in, right? That, that doesn't seem like you can't do a simple Google and come up with the top 10 vendors building building that right what you you what you describe the recycling center of the future I, I find that quite interesting i mean it says something it must be a really difficult challenge right or a really expensive one is. one or the other right it's I an mean, expensive it's, one without a doubt and it's not what you would call sexy correct sending correct. someone on the moon or shoving a roadster into into orbit seems like more fun than than a recycling center yeah. that um <laughs> it's a shame <laughs> it is a shame isn't it but <laughs> But so so here's a way to make it sexy, right? And this is something that that has been tried, and the challenge is is not for the faint of heart. But a view that I have is if I if I'm able to build this new sort of this new type of recycling, this recycling center of the future, the to me the success of phase two in this plan is to is to mobilize it. And th this was one of the things that that I really. I'm really pumped up about because I think we could do it is I want to clean up the great Pacific garbage patch. And I know that there's been a number of people who have gone out to do this and try it. Uh, and there's a couple of reasons. One, and this gets into the profitability aspect. Sean, before you go there, before you go there, before you go there, there's people out there who won't know what the great Pacific oh, garbage okay. patch is. So the oceans, so I will, so the, what the great Pacific garbage patch is, is um, it's an area within and every ocean actually has one. So the Pacific, Indian, Atlantic, and Arctic, they all have one because it's the way the currents meet together. And there's points in the middle of the oceans where they meet. And all the things that get thrown off of your cruise ships, you know, people who are like the transport ships transporting goods, they just dump all their garbage overboard. Or if things just get thrown into the ocean, they get picked up by the currents and they all tend to congregate in these areas where these currents meet. And the Great Pacific Garbage Patch is a massive space in the Pacific Ocean where all this garbage has come to meet. And it's been there for so long, there's actually, it's actually, you could almost make, you could make the argument that it's its own ecosystem at this point because it's been there for so long. Um, but and it's also polluting all the fish around it and everything else. Yeah. And and if you if you venture uh, if you venture another Google, go go look up Henderson Island in the Pacific. It's uh, by volume, it's one of the most it is I believe is the most polluted space on the planet, uh, with the density of plastics that get come up on its shores. Um, and so there's there's people who go there all the time to try to clean up the plastics and things like that. And that's typically what's in the great Pacific garbage patch. Yeah. So you were saying, you were saying making that, making that sexy. Making it sexy because one, I think cleaning up the great Pacific garbage patch in and of itself would be sexy. Getting the ocean cleaned up, getting, trying to, to reduce the, the, how significant of an impact we have on, um, on the oceans themselves. And at the same time, it's in international waters. And I checked with a friend of mine, an attorney, and I said, if I were to go and get plastics from the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, is it mine? 
Can I keep it? It's international waters, presumably. It's it an international waters. You water. might be a pirate, though, presumably. It, it, I'm sure I would, I would think so, because <laughs> they've also... Now, some of the tech that I think is really interesting out there, because there's been so much work around the Great Pacific Garbage Patches, that now I can take a piece of plastic from there, and then I can take it and have it DNA fingerprinted, if you will, and it'll tell me it's country of origin. Oh, really? Um, so you can see where this plastic comes from. So, I mean, there's just ama- amazing amounts of data that uh, that you can pull from that. But ultimately, for me, it would be clean it all up and then take take the recyclables that are whatever we can get out of it and be able to then resell those back on the open market, like go through some industrial, like, an industrial process that takes the plastic and gets it back into the beads, which uh, you can sell back into uh, everything but food grade plastics, I believe. And but that to me that would be sexy to have have an army of drone ships that go out to clean up the the garbage patches in every ocean, and then start looking at ways of making that profitable by being able to resell the recycled materials back onto the open market. And so that's to me, that's where we're starting to get sexy. And that then generates the whole, uh, whole sort of recyclable clothing, recyclable reuse of plastics, recyclable. Correct. They basically, get the raw materials back. Correct. You know what I'm thinking? As you say that, you know, I'm thinking about one of those James Bond movies where they had that ship within a ship, and the ship opens up from the hull and it scoops up, it scoops up smaller ships. So I'm imagining like a gigantic recycling. Yeah. Actually, we've got to do something with these cruise ships that can't be cruise ships anymore. <laughs> no, I'm just That's kidding. True. I'm, I'm kidding. But, but the idea basically, <laughs> the idea basically being to, to scoop up and have the recycling or rebeading, as I think the phrase you used, mm-hmm. um, all happen en route or from yeah. route. And you've got, and, and again, right, another, another mission would be maritime fuels, like we're talking about petroleum maritime diesel, is one of the biggest pollutants on the planet. So again, we would have to follow a much more, you know, we're again, we're not trying to add to, we're trying to take lessen the impact, not increase. So the drone ships, maybe they would be running off of solar, they would be running off something that was much more renewable instead of trying to run off maritime fuels. They're drone ships, so nobody's on board in the, in the perfect world, right? Nobody's on board. So it may take a week to get there, a month to get there. It's not like people are bored waiting for something to happen, right? Yeah. They're just out there doing their thing. So in my mind, that's, that's really starting to get to that point of, of marrying two things. One, we're cleaning up the world. Actually, it's three things. We're cleaning up the world. We're able to, make a, we're able to get raw materials back into the open market and reuse what we've already, we've already used once. And then three, turn a profit on this so that we can fund future phases or the next phase, if you will, of, of getting all of these things done, of, of how we go to the next phase. Because landfills are the big one. Landfills are definitely the big one for me. That's kind of my, that's my Everest, if you will. If we can get to a point where we are realistically able to start recycling and reclaiming materials out of landfills, that that would be huge because that's where I that's where I would say and well what do I think is sexy about that is I say I have the the hypothesis that we have no need to mine another metal out of the earth if we can find a better way of managing what we have in our landfills we don't need to take any more I mean, well, I'll expand it we don't need to take any more materials from the earth because they're, they're already there. They're already there in landfills. We've already done it. We've done it for hundreds, thousands of years. And so we don't need to take any more. And, and I mentioned, I, I remember, Vips, you and I were talking, and I mentioned this to you, and, and it, was the, it was one of the most inspirational things I had heard in a while, and it was one of the most least talked about things from Tesla's battery day they had a few weeks ago. Which the one thing that they slid under the radar, and you know, in their in their quest to fix battery density and to be able to replace every car in the United States with an EV, with an electric vehicle, using their new battery tech, they also said that in recycling of the old batteries, they would no longer need to mine iron, cobalt, or nickel anymore. 
And that's a huge statement to make. Um, when you think about, you know, think about just the dirtiness of the mining process and what the mining process sure. is. Um, you know, there's a reason why a Toyota Prius has a carbon footprint of a Hummer 3, right? It's it's because... The co- yeah, the cost to make it. The, the cost the of cost making to- those batteries is, is huge. And so to be able to to hit that point where they don't need to mine any more metals once they're able to hit this three terawatt hour goal or whatever battery capacity um, is, is amazing. And that's what I believe if we can have better management of our waste, we are already there. We do not need to mine anymore. We just need to have a better way of, of, of managing it. And and this is where if, I, if I'm going to take it you know, you know, my vision, and you mentioned Mr. Fusion earlier, which I think, uh, you know, the, again, the most incredible invention uh, from the Back to the Future series. Oh, come on. The, the, hover, the hovering the hoverboards are pretty cool. Come on. The, the, those, those were pretty neat. <laughs> but, but Probably not as profound. But <laughs> to, get, to get 1.21 gigawatts out of a banana? I don't know. That, that, that's, uh, I don't know. Might be a tie. But... Um, you know, the, the, the idea of, you know, we, we take it down to science and we take it down to the first law of thermodynamics, right? And I hope, I hope I got these right. I know there's a few laws of thermodynamics. But uh, basically says that if I have enough pressure and temperature, I can break up all the materials into the periodic table of elements if I want to. Um, there's a lot of things that I know a lot of chemical companies and there's a lot of chemical processes that leverage this in order to get things to clean out or to, you know, basically to be able to manufacture a lot of the things that, that we use, they use this process, but why can't we do it with the waste? So imagine if we have a whole bunch of plastic and metal and whatever thrown into a, a, a pail and we, we, we have it in a, in a vat or a bin where we're able to control the temperature and pressure inside that, that bin and then have Okay, now we've got the carbon is going to go this way, and the iron is going to go this way, and the copper is going to go this way. And so what we wind up with is these 250-something vats of periodic table of the elements. And then what do we? And then where Mr. Fusion comes in is we have this concept of what, I, what I've called a 3D fusion printer, where I can just punch in the, what materials do I want to actually manufacture and then it will go through and create it. It'll create oak. It'll create a pl- it'll create a plastic. It'll create whatever I want using fusion. And then if we're able to accomplish that, the energy coming off of that fusion process could also fix the negative energy problem that I talked about earlier. Meaning if I'm able to generate if I'm actually able to do this level of fusion, the energy that will come off of that process could power everything else. And if we can do that, then that would then enable us to no longer have garbage. Because now I can take a can yeah. of whatever you please, dump it on of a conveyor belt, and what comes out of it is raw materials to build your house. And that starts to become, because then what we're talking about is, again, pushing raw materials back onto the open market, reusing what we already have. And if we're able to do that at a national level or even on a global level someday, probably not in my lifetime, but at a global (laughs) level someday, then we're also able to drive the cost of goods down for everybody across the planet. So it, you know, it, it just seems like that there's this virtuous cycle that we can create by having a better management of our waste. That's so cool. I love the way you uh, you told that story all the way through. I'm kind of conscious. I'm not sure we hit your third phase and there's someone going to be listening to this and they're going to be like, well, I know my phase one. I know my phase two, which is building a better recycling center. What was your phase three? Mm-hmm. Phase three is going to be the landfills. It's the landfills. Okay. The, that's the landfills. And, and you know, I've talked to some folks in, you know, in, in, in the oil and gas industry, because in a lot of ways, they're the ones who have the money to do the research and development. And what I have heard is that we're still probably about 10 years away from a fusion process. Um, But that's still only 10 years away, right? So that's really exciting. 
um, thinking about that the viability of something like that because uh, you know the energy companies they're also looking at okay how can we how can we do the transition from oil to electric right because that's that's the trend mm -hmm. that we're seeing in terms mm -hmm. of our vehicles and so it's not just our vehicles starting though, right i mean it's everything isn't it everything yeah and even in the cyber truck that tesla put out there they've got a an electric four-wheeler right an atv that'll that'll yeah. be an option for not about you man. i think it's really ugly i it's, it's doing nothing you know, for me yeah, that, that that's a hot, you know, <laughs> I'm at that, there's that meme where I'm, it's like, you know, I think it's really ugly. It's not so bad. It's kind of growing on me and it's really cool. I'm on the, almost it's really cool uh, to the point where I convinced my wife to let me put a, a pre-order. Oh, did you really? I did. Yeah. For the truck? For the truck. I'd never have guessed. I'd it's, never take you. I, I figured you more for a Model 3, Model S kind of character. I didn't figure you oh. for a truck. <laughs> No, I, uh, I want a truck. That's awesome. Uh, yeah. But. That's really cool. So, you know, you're, 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 when you, you know, so there's going to be people who are on listening to this and they're going to be like, well, that sounds like, that sounds like um, utopia, what you described there in terms of that kind mm -hmm. of that fusion based virtuous cycle of breaking things down into their so element components and being able to effectively reconstruct anything when you need to. I mean, we're talking, I mean, that, that to me sounds seriously sci fi. How seriously mm -hmm. sci-fi are we talking about here? I don't believe it's as sci-fi. Now, let me take a step back from from all the way I, all the way to that fusion cycle that's there. But I think just having the ability to go and get the metals out of the landfill is it, it'd be a huge step, right? There's there's obviously a lot of there's a lot of reasons why you wouldn't have people people would not be doing that, right? Because it's just not. There's, there's a whole lot of reasons why it's not safe. But um, the ability to go in and just get the metals out. I mean, just thinking about how much copper, how much of all the metals that are in there. I think that would be a huge win um, in that respect. I mean, it's going to be a very phased process on how we go in or, and are able to do that. To get to a point to where it is this virtuous cycle where garbage trucks pull up to a building and just dump things into a bin and then they go on about their business and there's no much, no longer a concept of a landfill. Um, I, I can definitely see how that's utopia because it's just, it's so far away from anything we've done for 10,000 years. It, it is, it is. And so it's, and I, and it, like I said, it, it's probably, you know, not something that is going to happen, you know, I don't know, in the next 50 years, just because, it's just a lot of change. There's a lot of there's a lot of things that have to happen in order to get there, but it, it's about getting us on the right path to being able to manage that waste. Because again, you know, our our process doesn't seem to be scaling. Because if we look at the overall environmental impact and we see all the different impacts we're having on on the environment, it just doesn't seem to scale. And and you know, in my lifetime, the population of the of the Earth has doubled once mm. and it's my understanding that it will double again before before i leave and so it's and so you know we're starting to have this problem of scale and so we've got to have a better way of managing it because eventually there's not going to be enough holes that we can dig um you know i think of star wars think of the, the planet coruscant right yeah it was basically a planet that was one big city well landfills don't scale in that kind of a world so we need to Think about better ways of managing it. That's awesome. Well, wow, Sean, that was that was so so much fun. Um, it, that was what I call a fabulous big idea, and uh, that's kind of what we want to do in this series. We want to we want to take these you know ideas that sound you know maybe a little bit science fiction, maybe a little bit too far out. But these are if we don't if we don't start thinking about some of these ideas, you know, it's it's from these it's from these from our imagination and our creativity that we find. Um, uh, solutions that will ultimately change the world. And it's just great. It's great working with Sean. And just um, uh, it was a treat for me and for you to hear just how much thought he's gone, has gone into um, everything he shared with us today. Um, we're going to come back. We're going to do another one. We've got, we've got four or five of these um, big ideas. And so, um, yeah, we're going to do another one. We're going to probably do, do one of these every month or so. And uh, we're putting them out on this podcast. But thank you all for listening. And everyone, don't forget, be fabulous. Mm -hmm.